Good morning, everyone. And I'm so thrilled to be here again uh, for another installment of Julie's PR Patter. I'm Julie Livingston. I'm president of Want Leverage Communications, uh, a LinkedIn marketing and public relations agency here in New York. And I am delighted to have a fantastic guest with me today. Her name is Dr. Deb Mashak. She's a PhD and an experienced business advisor, professor, higher education administrator, and a national nonprofit executive. Wow. Previously a full professor of social psychology at Harvey Mudd College, Deb is the author of the newly published book, Collaborate, How to Build Incredibly Collaborative Relationships at work, even if you'd rather work alone. I love that. I love that little that tagline there. <laughs> Name one of the wink. top 25 women in higher education. Deb has been featured in major media outlets, including the New York Times, the Atlantic, and she writes regularly for Psychology Today. So Deb, thank you so much for joining me. Um, this uh, The topic of collaboration is something that's really near and dear to my heart. Uh, as someone who has led marketing communications teams and regularly works with, you know, in my own business, I work with lots of outside vendors and, and people, client teams. Collaboration is so critical, <laughs> but it doesn't always work. So, <laughs> so yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of, uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. There's definitely a lot of pain in collaboration for a lot of us, at least some of the time. And I think we got to talk about that if we have any hope of making this whole playing well together thing more productive and less painful for everyone. Uh, I, I totally agree. So let's start out by why don't you just define what collaboration is? I got to say, it's one of these words that needs a lot of unpacking in part because culturally we throw it around. It's like, yes, it's good to collaborate. We should we should collaborate. And, you know, companies throw it on the letterhead or back in the, the time before you would walk into these corporations. And it's one of the words that would be stenciled on the wall along with, you know, excellence and innovation. You would see collaboration, but there's often very little effort in those spaces to actually say, what, what do we mean by this? And so sure, it's a value. Sure, it's a skill in the sense of you need people who know how to follow through on what they say they're going to do. You need people who know really basic things around time management and project management. You need people who know the skills of how to contribute meaningfully and constructively and God forbid, on topic and meetings. That's all really important. And Collaboration is also this entire ecosystem uh, when we when we talk about companies. So yeah, I when I think about what is collaboration, I take this. You know, you, you mentioned the past professor, so I'm, I'm a recovering academic, so I have to define my terms. <laughs> um, and, and so I I take the perspective that collaboration is the process of two or more individuals who know each other working together towards some shared goal. That can be short-term, long-term, it can be remote, hybrid, in-person. It can be you know, something that's governed by a heck of a lot of contracts, or it can be something that's more informal. So there really are a lot of different ways that we work together. And I think it's important to point out that the, the root of co collaboration is co-labor or together work. And so this is a, a broad space with a lot of different moving parts, and it's, it's sometimes hard to pin down. And thus, it's, I think that's part of the reason it's hard to get right. Yeah. I mean, I have managed teams when I've been on staff and corporations, and um, I have often found that um, there is an anti-collaboration culture that, you know, people are more in competition with each other. So tell me what um, what's at stake? What happens when collaboration goes well or doesn't go so well? Right. There's this whole dynamic of what happens if it sizzles versus fizzles. And I, I love that you point out the relationship that a lot of people assume to exist between collaboration and competition. So what's interesting is on a team, if you've got competition, that means that they see each other as the the one, you know, the other person on the team is the person competing for the resources or the time or whatever the assets or the outcomes, the accolades, those sorts of things are. But if collaboration is going well within the organization, it's actually a competitive advantage. When you think about those other organizations or your competitive, like your true competitors as the competition, then if we're working well together, so if the organs in the organization are truly harmonized and you know doing resonance and you know, all, everything's feeling good and working well, 
that is a benefit to the company. So when it so when collaboration sizzles, you get these high level benefits to the organization around bottom lines. When it's it is sizzling, you get benefits to the team, such as the timelines are being met and things are humming along and the, the baton, blah, blah, baton tosses are, are really clean and you get benefits for individuals. So when we are on teams and we're, we're feeling visible and seen and we're actually able to make a contribution and it's fun working with Julie ah, and, you know, and all these good fun. things. Fun. Well, how does fun factor into work? Right. <laughs> right. And then you, we, we know that people who are in high quality collaborative relationships, their anxiety is lower, their depression is lower, their engagement at work and their workplace satisfaction is higher. So there are these benefits for individuals, for teams and for organizations across all of these spaces of timelines, bottom lines, well-being, innovation, all the things we say we care about, yet, you know, this black box, the collaboration, people aren't necessarily um, pulling the levers there in a way that can actually help those things they care about most. This is so powerful. And, you know, aside from fostering a collaborative culture, company culture, you know, internally with clients, um, if you're a service provider, uh, being, having a collaborative culture provides you with an opportunity to tell your, your story about being collaborative. And this has tremendous PR benefits. Um, I know that in the LinkedIn strategy work that I do for executives, for senior executives, I'm often writing on their behalf about how collaborative their culture is and what they're able to get accomplished because of it. So when you're able to tell that story about collaboration to outside stakeholder audiences, it really positions your organization as one that is, you know, right in step with 21st century um, standards, cultural standards. It shows that you're an emotionally intelligent organization and one that is going to be uh, beneficial in terms of you know, generating great stuff, right? You're going to, you're, you're probably going to be, tend to be more innovative in, and creative in problem solving because people are working so well together. So there's a great story there. And one that really, as you say, it is a competitive advantage and one that you can promote heavily. And so you bring up a couple really important points that I just want to to quote double click on. One of which is the idea that we're not just collaborating within the team, but also you mentioned external vendors. You're yeah. collaborating with your customers. You're collaborating on behalf of your customers. And one of the first things I do when I'm getting ready to go into an organization, I'll go look at Trustpilot. I'll go look at what's happening on their social feeds. Because if you're not telling the story about you being collaborative, chances are somebody else is telling the story about how you're not. And it could be your past employees who, you know, on on um, glass, oh, what is it? Glass. Glass door. Thank you. Um, they're telling the story about your toxic work culture and how people are in competition and how they hate going into work because the people are jerks. You know what? That, those are big, fat red flags that you've got a collaboration Big problem. time. And I'm also looking at, you know, trust pilot. So if I see stories about, you know, this customer who got passed off um, from person to person to person to get a solution to their tech problem, for instance, that's a collaboration problem. There's something happening behind the scenes that really is signaling the parts are not working together. It's like the gears and the clock are all crusty, rusty, and just not moving right. And that becomes really apparent. So if you see those sorts of flags, it is a PR problem. It really and, is. It really does yeah. affect your reputation. It affects um, the way or the way you can't attract new talent and retain talent. And it's in today's absolutely. market, that's not something to be taken lightly. There's some um, data from Simply Five, and unfortunately, I don't know when it was collected because that detail is not on the report, talking about how many people are have considered leaving a job because of poor workplace relationships. It's incredibly high. How many people are actively right now thinking about leaving because of poor uh, workplace relationships? It's really high. And so the idea that collaboration is somehow a nice to have or that it's something you, you try to retrofit 
by the way, collaboration is really hard to retrofit, but you can't just retrofit right. and be like, oh, well, you know, we did a happy hour. Why don't people like each other? It's not just a nice to have, it's essential. And we absolutely need to invest in it up front at the very beginning of onboarding. Um, and we need to be thinking about, as you talk about with the, the PR piece, how we're talking about it and demonstrating it. And it's not, it's more complicated than just throwing the word collaboration on your social, you know, like that's not going to do the trick. No, it's not. And it's not a one and done, right? It's an ongoing process and ongoing a work in process to get people to really collaborate and work, work well together so that they're feeding each other. Right. right. So how can business leaders create a, a culture of collaboration? Do you have any tips that you can share? Yeah. So this idea of you know, I, I touched on it a little bit at the top where we need to think holistically about the collaboration ecosystem. So it begins with hiring people who feel positively about collaboration, who you can you know, look at past behaviors, look at how they talk about their, their former collaborators and see if they're using we instead of a bunch of I words. So how we hire and bring people in who have a collaborative orientation, that matters. When we're onboarding, before we start putting people on a bunch of interdependent teams where my, my outcomes are dependent on your behaviors, and then I might dislike you very quickly, go ahead and give time to let people develop relationships with other people. So it can be as simple as, you know, pay for coffee just for them to go out for coffee with everybody on the team um, do introductions beyond just a, here's my role and job description, but who are you? What do you care about? What makes you tick? What keeps you up at night? What do you love? You know, tell me about your family, get to know Definitely. other people. And you can structure that in as a leader into the onboarding. So you've got those collaborative individuals, collaborative relationships, thinking then about collaborative culture. There are, you know, five things you need to have in place, quite frankly, collaboration first needs to be possible because if you've put up all sorts of barriers in your infrastructure right. where it's not even possible to collaborate, guess what? You're not going to get it. Next, you need to have collaboration that is easy. So, you know, remember that moment when we all moved into remote work and suddenly it's like, oh, how are we going to work? And the, just the, the interfaces weren't in place to actually make sure. collaboration easy. Then we all quickly onboarded, you know, Zoom and other other digital project products that made that possible. So, But you, you, need, need, you need to know how to use them too, those tech tools. Right. You can't just drop it in. <laughs> no. So now... So now it's possible. We've made it easy. Next, we need to make it normative. We need to make it clear that this is what we do, whether it's calendar invites um, that you know make clear when the collaborative team is meeting or we're telling the stories of the amazing collaborative team, what they did together that was beyond what any of them could have possibly done alone. So once we've made it normative, next, we need to make it rewarding. Look, if you're a leader, look at your incentives. If you say you want collaboration, but the only thing you're rewarding are individual outputs, and products, you got a misalignment. And as any you know, parent or pet owner will tell you, what gets rewarded gets repeated. So if you're rewarding individual behaviors and outcomes, guess what? You're not going to get collaboration. So you want to get those aligned. And finally, if you have to, you can use policy as a way of making collaboration required. So that the stack of five things is how you can really develop this collaborative culture. What those are great and and really give you give me so much to think about. Um, Deb, how, what is the role of the leader of whether it's, you know, way at the top, the senior executive of the organization or, uh, you know, a group or team manager, department, department manager, what is their role in kind of modeling collaborative behavior? That was the first thing that came to my mind is they've got to be walking the walking the talk, right? So if I say, oh, we're, you know, we value collaboration and I'm the leader. But then when it comes time for me, whether it's in the design or the implementation phase to add my value to that project, and I, I do it at the wrong time. So I jump in and I start micromanaging um, and giving input when I don't, it's not my turn yet. Or if I say, yeah, yeah, I'm going to get you feedback on that by Friday morning. So you could turn it around, you know, Friday <laughs> afternoon to the client, but then you don't bother to open the file until 4 p.m. Guess what? You have just created a fire for everybody else on that team. 
You're signaling that actually I can't be trusted right. to keep my word. You're signaling, hey, by the way, um, I'm not going to say it explicitly because I could get in trouble from HR, but really I do expect you to be working on the weekend. So, you know, walking the talk, actually following through on what you say you're going to do. And then because uh, that helps create the trust, but also in the spirit of transparency, share are we allowed to use, I won't say, I'll say share the crappy first draft, share the impartial work, the work that's not quite completed to model that. In fact, I trust others to step in, to give feedback in a way that helps us co-create this thing that we value. And I'm not so anxious about other people's approval that I'm going to hold tight and tell it's just perfect because obviously none of our work is ever that, totally perfect. I so those are that. some ideas. I yeah. love that. I, in fact, as when I did lead um, t internal teams, I found that that was the sure way to innovate and be creative to, you know, I would kind of start something and then I'd hand it over and say, you know, put your touch on it, edit it, feel free because I want your input. I want your perspective. And I know that together we're going to come up with something even better. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think too, like when I think about higher up the ladder, so when we're talking about C-suite, what can they be doing? I think even taking a look at or asking your people to take a look at the policies and the existing documents, including things like vendor contracts. If you look at your vendor contract and it's all about protecting your interest and there's nothing there about sharing risk, right. guess what you're saying? And this matters to me as a as an external contractor, when I look and it's all about, yeah, you know, you can't sue us, but we can see, sue you. I'm like, why would I bother with that as a contract? Where it's just really asymmetrical. There are ways that you're signaling your orientation toward relationships in those external um, reports to your stakeholders, in those communications to your whole team, and the, you know, the, even your vendor contracts. So take a look at them and ask with the lens of asking yourself, what does this say about how we value each other, how we value other people's contributions, how we value these relationships? One of the things that um, I am a vendor to, as you are, to um, larger companies that you know want to increase their ex executive presence on LinkedIn, et cetera, in the media. And one of the things that has really resonated with me is I have one client, she's the chief communications officer at a fortune 50 company. And she on a regular basis says to me, how are you doing? Is there anything that we can be doing better? How is, how's the communication going between our team and with you? Um, are you missing anything? And I, it kind of stops me in my tracks because that is such an important sig sign of collaboration and caring. I love that. And the Isn't other thing, great? yeah, the other thing that's bubbling up for me is when we think about how do we initiate and maintain collaborative action, one of the steps people often skip over is that assessment part. They might assess and say, are we meeting our KPIs? You know, like, does this product, you know, did it sell enough units or something like that? But they forget to evaluate the health of the collaboration itself. So is this together work that we're doing still serving the needs, the interests, the hopes, the dreams of the individual contributors? If not, how do we bring it back into alignment? And so what she's doing there very clearly, and it sounds like in almost a, a pulse-like way, as opposed to waiting till the end of your, your contract or your work together, is she's saying, hey, Julie, I value you too. How's this going for you? Exactly. What else do you need? Do you have the resources, the skills, the, the people, the access that you're going to need to help us be successful? That's incredible. It really is. And you know what? It's such a huge motivator. I mean, I'm motivated anyway. I want to do well by them and I really enjoy the work. But when, when she started checking in with me on a regular basis, first of all, I look forward to, I look forward to it. And I feel like I just want to do better. I want to exceed their expectations. I want, I want my creative wheels to be turning like crazy because I want to keep feeding them with new ideas because they value me. And, and my imagine you know, most, and most of us are like that too, because yeah. we want to be seen and valued. So imagine if that level of attention is given to everybody on our team and 
imagine what we could unlock in terms of potential on innovation, on the creativity, on, you know, coming up with incredible solutions to the these incredible problems that are facing the world. So whether we're talking about in a nonprofit organization or in a for-profit company, being able to unlock the incredible potential in your people that's sitting right there by seeing them and value, valuing them, what could be better? So amazing. Yeah. I mean, I have one client that is, uh, they have a highly collaborative culture and they are a service provider to other, to large companies. Um, and their collaborative culture is so palpable that their clients are now uh, trying to mirror them. Like they have not only delivered great work to, to the client, but their culture is now being copied by the client because they've kind of role modeled this incredible collaboration. One of the th last things I wanted to ask you, Deb, was, you know, we all, a lot of us kind of can work in a small internal team, but how do you foster interdepartmental collaboration? Because sometimes you have those micro cultures that exist. How do you, how do you, you know, get people to kind of, um, meet and get to know each other across departments. Let's say the tech department, and I'm just making this up, tech and human resources or marketing yeah. and technology. Yeah. Or marketing and sales or yeah. R&D and manufacturing. I mean, it's all, the, the whole idea is that when we're trying to collaborate across differences, whether it's skip rank, interdepartmental, interorganizational, um, across regional differences, time zone differences, generational differences, demographic differences, whatever it is, the principles are the same. That first of all, we need to get to know the other people as people. Um, but also within those departments, guess what? You're going to be using different vocabulary. There's different jargon. There's different outcomes that are valued in that department versus that department. If you go in with your lens and assuming that you already know what is valued over there, you're likely to make a misstep. So instead, what you want to do is sit down and say, what does good work look like over there? What do you really value? What are some of the concerns that you all are navigating? What do you wish more people understood about your department than they do? Like, what do people, like, what do people get wrong? And ideally, you get a chance to share those same things. And then you co-design the work. How do we want to work together? Um, some, you know, some organizations, different departments have kind of different rhythms and cadences. So for instance, in a PR space, you're working fast. I mean, it's like something comes in, you're responding the next minute. Um, in more of a, a, you know, in another department, it might be like, yeah, like in academia, for instance, what is the curriculum? Well, we're going to talk about that for next semester, you know, and it's the, the time horizons are really sure. different. And unless we're sensitive to the possibility that our assumptions about how work needs to get done are not shared, we're not going to bother asking other people um, to, to kind of reveal what's inside for them. So, so that to me is such a critical step. And again, organizational leaders um, can help can help create those conversations. Can you know offer templates of like here are some quite you know that list of questions I just rattled off. You could share those and say you know I we're going to ask you to do this cross departmental work. I recommend you start by spending thirty minutes talking through these five items. Yeah, and that's like an icebreaker too because the people are at, at all uncomfortable about it, and that's natural. Um, they at least have a starting point. And I think this is one of the reasons those individuals who have bounced around across different functional areas over their career are able to figure out the vocabulary, the jargon. They're able to serve in this translator role that really does, you know, grease the skids for good interdepartmental collaboration. It's awesome. Deb, thank you so much. I can't believe we're out of time, but thank you so that much went for joining me. Incredibly today. fast. Yeah. Thank you for everyone. Having me look on, for on Deb's new book, Collaborate. It's available on Amazon. Yes, everywhere um, great books you, are sold. There's a link to her website here. So, um, Deb, I hope you'll come back sometime and we'll continue this later. But uh, have a great day, everyone. And I'll see you next week on another installment of Julie's PR Patter. <laughs>